All right. Welcome, everyone, to our monthly talk series. I'm sorry for the delay, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that Jürgen will make up with his performance um, for the delay. Um, I'm happy to introduce Jürgen Janhardt, um, who is currently a post at UBC, University of British Columbia in Vancouver. He joined the InfoBiz group led by Tamara Manza. Um, some of you might know Tamara. She was giving a talk here. Um, and, and Jürgen is now a postdoc here. Um, before that, he studied um, he studied computer science at the UC in 2015, then later on, uh, later on when he took the brown book for IG. And then he was a postdoc to uh, Darmstadt, leading his own group, um, the Visual Interactive Machine Group. And he also received a couple of prizes. And now he's a postdoc in Vancouver. And Jürgen is going to talk about enhancing interactive machine learning. And I'm really looking forward to, to your talk here. Uh, the stage is yours. Thanks, Mark. Um, thanks for the introduction. I'm looking forward to give the talk as well. Um, I'm so sorry that I cannot be with you today in person, but uh, I'm very happy that internet connection is working quite well. Uh, my apologies for uh, being late. I cannot not exclude that I'm part of the confusion. I'm very sorry for that. And uh, yeah, I will speed up a little bit to, to come back in time. Um, and uh, so I would like to enjoy talking with you now. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I can already skip the introduction slide because you've already introduced me quite well with all the important information where I've been and what I'm doing. Um, so what I would like to start with is an introduction to interactive machine learning, something that drives me a lot uh, at the moment, um, which also frames my talk. I will provide a series of references of other people, uh, and then afterwards I will talk about two research branches in specific, which are defined by myself. Um, I would like to open with a schematic scheme of the interactive machine learning process, how it was defined by Murray et al., uh, where a machine learning process is sort of at the center of it with a predefined input and output. And after the training and testing phase, a machine learning model can be used in practice. And what we can do is to extend this process uh, by humans, by users, which are providing, who are providing data, data, model parameters, or labels. And the machine learner in itself can provide predictions, recommendations, classes, quality measures as an output. And so we have an interactive machine learning loop here, and we can use the best of two worlds to produce better machine learning models at the end. While the traditional machine learning process looks a bit like this, where a machine learning model is explicitly maintained by a data scientist who is a sort of mediator between machine learning on the one hand and end users on the other hand, uh, one can imagine some collaborative approach between human uh, users and uh, data scientists both participating in a machine learning process. And if you think this a bit more further, you can even consider that a human may be solely involved in a machine learning process and there will no, no mediator be needed anymore. And this is somehow my vision and uh, what I would like to follow. And it's not only my vision, it's also uh, very affine to um, uh, vision analytics research in, uh, for, for many people. And this is why I'm bringing up this slide, which shows how machine learning and visualization can be combined. Uh, the strength of both can be combined. And this is also uh, being published in three very, very good survey papers, which I'm citing here at the bottom, uh, which are um, um, already introducing this idea. And the question is, why do we need machine learning? Because algorithms can reveal patterns that humans cannot. Um, they are fast and very effective. And they are a very good choice if a problem can be solved automatically. And uh, the question is, why then do we need interactive visualization? Because it enables humans to understand and communicate patterns, gain insight from data, and make decisions from it steer models, change parameters, change perspectives on data. And finally, it's always a good choice when the problem cannot be solved automatically. So what Dominic Sacher et al, for example, propose is this pipeline, which uh, nicely shows how interactive machine learning uh, and visual analytics can be uh, combined uh, with, five, with four steps, plus uh, a user, 
who is an evaluator on the very right. I would not go into details right now, but I, it's a very good recommendation to go into this survey if you're interested in interactive machine learning at a glance. And along these lines, I would also like to emphasize Alex Endert and Al's work, uh, which is a uh, similar regard, but uh, differently, uh, differently structured. Here, uh, different machine learning techniques are uh, surveyed by the definition of parameters and, and models, and on the other hand, the evaluation of it. So what are the research opportunities that we have using visual interactive machine learning? Well, first of all, let's see the model-centered and the user-centered. I uh, think that I deem particularly important to not only focus on models, but also focus on humans. Assigning the humans in the loop in a highly iterative and uh, interactive machine learning loop can be transparent, interpretable, and also explainable. It can be personalized. Uh, it can consider human factors and it can be open for experts, but also for non-experts. This sort of uh, opens the scope for research opportunities, and I would like to show you two example researches that I'm currently doing uh, in this particular regard. It's, on the one hand, visual an analysis of time-oriented data, and on the other hand, uh, we all, which is the idea to incorporate visually interactive interfaces for data labeling. So coming to the first focus, which is an analysis of time-oriented data, um, I cannot give a talk about time-oriented data without uh, emphasizing how much I like the book uh, by Wolfgang, Silvia, Heidi, and Christian. I read it so often, I used it in my PhD so often. And uh, it's already eight years old, but still it's, to me, uh, it, has, uh, it provides still a, a series of works about um, methodology and also examples, so very interesting to read. Um, what I did in my PhD is the idea to focus on exploratory search in time-oriented data. It's the idea to combine exploration and search, which are two different sort of tasks. And for time-oriented data, data research challenges often involve to find trends or periodic patterns, frequent patterns, relations in data. And these all help researchers to gain knowledge out of it. And what you can see here is the process that usually researchers go through. They record data into the wild, process it, analyze it, and then archive it. And in most cases, this is it. And in a good case, they are able to search for it. And in a perfect case, they are able, uh, able to reuse the data. And in a wonderful world, even others can reuse the data of, of researchers um, to avoid that we have to travel to the South Pole simply to use the data that this guy at the upper left, uh, at the upper right, has recorded. And to support this, I focused on exploratory search. I would like to characterize search at time-oriented data. It's the idea that researchers have a quite, uh, um, quite precise information needs, for example, this shape, and they would like to search for it. The problem is that in current search systems, only textual search is available in metadata. And searching for shapes is something that has not been discovered in practice yet. And what someone can envision is the idea to have content-based search queries, for example, query by sketch or query by example. Uh, for example, like provided by Ben Schneiderman and Harry Hochheiser in uh, 2004. Uh, exploration is sort of the opposite idea. It's neither knowing what to seek nor where to seek, but we know that there's a lot of data out there. So this is a very ill-defined information need. It's a complex information need. And the question is how this can combine and compose together with search systems. And what I would like to emphasize is the work by Jack van Wyck, which is the idea to provide overviews of time series, in this case, daily patterns in a clustering approach. And I'm very glad that he received the Test of Time Award uh, at WIS this year for, the, for this work, which is 20 years old and still so great. I'm citing it still all the time because it's a very lovely design and shows how all of these of time series can be provided. I would like to show you a very a quick video how such an exploratory search system can look like. This is a web-based digital library system showing daily patterns which, which have been trained with a neural network, in this case, a self-organizing map. And you can see how a user browses through it, selects a linear upward trend, uh, cl clicks on it, um, queries for details now, real existing details uh, about this particular shape. And it's also possible to use this shape as a search query loaded in the query editor. Uh, maybe the user want to adapt the search um, the, the sketch in the, um, the query, which is done right now. 
you can see that the user tries to linearize this upward trend a bit more and then searches for it. And the result is a content-based search showing in red the patterns that have been found with this upward trend, for example, a measurement which has been taken place at the Antarctica um, or in, the, in Alaska. Uh, the user can also try, uh, click on the Find More button to, to receive more res search results. There is metadata provided at the right, there is faceted search provided at the left, and this sort of completes the idea of exploratory search in time-oriented data as I researched it in my PhD thesis. What has it to do with interactive machine learning? A lot. Um, I had three focus in my thesis. First of all was on interactive preprocessing, on interactive cluster analysis, and also on interactive relation seeking, which is the idea to seek between data content and metadata, which is attached. I would like to show you one very brief example, a video, how a self-organizing map a clustering algorithm can be trained interactively. And this is shown like here, you see at the top a very confused a manifold of a network, which is now trained in the video. And you can see how the network learns about the data patterns, which are trajectories in this case. And you can see how different patterns are aligned at different places of the manifold. And now the patterns evolve and evolve, and the data is learned by this manifold. And if you may ask what is interactive about this, it's the idea that the manifold can be defined in advance. There can be fixed points defined, for example, this vertical pattern, which is, um, is to be trained in the manifold. Parameters can be changed. Uh, the quality can be assessed, and it can also be retrained. So this is sort of the first interactive machine learning approach that I published uh, yeah, 10 years ago, which sort of frames um, interactive machine learning from a chronological perspective. These are some references about exploratory search. And I would like to um, introduce you very briefly to a project that was more recently conducted, which is the segmentation and la labeling of multivariate time series, uh, which we call the BISSECT project. It's the idea to have a multivariate time series, which is divided into smaller, more meaningful units to reveal underlying mechanisms and to foster knowledge generation. And um, you can imagine a multivariate time series as uh, a time series which would have a multivariate value domain, meaning that there are multiple values for every time step. Uh, for example, different uh, physical units. Uh, so there are also different semantics involved, which doesn't make it easier. Uh, there is a series of application examples out there. I only took these five because they were most relevant to the project. And this is the project overview slide. It's a DFG-funded DACH project uh, where Heidi Schumann from Rostock, Silvia Mick from Vienna, and Dieter Fenner and Jörn Kohlhammer and myself contributed from the Darmstadt site. And our research goal was to uh, investigate approaches for the visual control and evaluation of time series segmentation and labeling techniques. There are overall three different challenges involved. Uh, first of all, the algorithms to segment time series in a pipeline. Second, the uncertainty, which is inherent to the data and produced by the algorithms as well. And third, the parameters for steering the segmentation pipelines. The good thing is that the competences of Darmstadt, Vienna, and Rostock fits quite well to these different types of challenges. And this is why uh, this collaborative approach was able to sort of create solutions for the segmentation and labeling of time, multivariate time series. We did some um, design studies into, into the wild um, and with uh, external collaborators and gained experiences and expertises in that regard, uh, which we could use to abstract and condense in the end because we find commonalities among these use cases. And in every case, there was a need for automated segmentation methods so a segmentation pipeline is needed, which cons usually consists of a, a cascade of different algorithmic models. And there's also a need for trust in algorithms and in the generated results, which uh, emphasizes the need uh, and the usefulness of, make of using visual analytics. And what we proposed at EuroVA two years ago was a segmentation pipeline, which you can see here. Um, at a glance, multivariate time series is coming from the right, and at the, at the very end, is it, the time series is segmented. And in between, the time series runs through a data processing uh, 
process a pipeline followed by a segmentation algorithm pipeline. This is something that has to do with algorithm selection. So these are my playgrounds. Um, there is parameterization involved in all the algorithms, which is con uh, research from Rostock side. And there's also uncertainty involved in the process from the data and the algorithms, which is conducted from the Vienna side. And then there's a visual interactive analysis ongoing and a feedback loop uh, to improve the quality of segmented uh, time series. I would today like to focus on the first part of it, <clears throat> which is pre-processing of multivariate time series. And what I did um, is, yeah, today I will show it to you as an uh, example from uh, machine learning, for interactive machine learning. And um, maybe um, if you have ever worked with time series, you have similar problems that time series needs to be in a useful state or condition to be applicable and clean enough for downstream analysis tasks. And uh, there is a lot we can do with time series, but it's always good to have time series which has no missing values, no outliers. It should be normalized, reduced by noise, uh, maybe sampled, and maybe equidistant. And all this, what uh, is so necessary, has to be somehow in, in the best possible way. And this is why we did this pre-processing um, approach. There is a good news. Uh, because we know what dirtiness means. There's a lot of taxonomies out there how dirty time series can be characterized. So the problem space is quite known. And there's another good news. There's a lot of algorithm out there from the data mining and machine learning field uh, how these uh, problems could be solved. But there is a gap, and this is the interactive machine learning part. So my approaches to do that are actually missing and there is no visual analytics support. And this is the question how this can be realized. And this is what we did um, to solve these challenges. First, the gap between machine learning algorithms and the methodology of visual analytics. Second, the dimensionality of multivariate time series. Third, the parameterization of these processes. And fourth, uh, with an emphasis, the uncertainty that is introduced by pre-processing routines. And what we did, uh, in a Eurovis paper last year is to present the, the first usual interactive pre-processing approach for multivariate time series. We came up with a characterization of tasks. You can see here how a time series in blue is pre-processed by some routine in orange, and this routine has to be created somehow. This is the first task about pipeline creation. The second task is how to parameterize routines uh, a third task is related to the comparison of the output. So the input and the output time series is, is to be compared. Um, these routines produce uncertainty because they have an effect on time series, which is something that can be assessed. The dimensions of the multivariate time series are to be analyzed as well. And there is a process pipeline ongoing with many algorithms involved. So the comparison can also be between uh, time series at the very end and the very beginning which um, produces cascades effects, which we also analyzed in that uh, publication. Today, there is only time to emphasize four of these aspects, which will, uh, I will do in the following. First of all, I would like to introduce how we um, solve the problem of the interactive pipeline creation. At the left, you can see a lightweight uh, workflow construction tool, uh, which is available online. I, I have the URLs for our sources here. And uh, it's an interactive pipeline for the creation of uh, uh, routines to pre-process pre multivariate time series. Um, uh, it couples um, the pipeline with visual uh, analysis interfaces, which you can see at the right. And the good thing is that all the six different tasks that I, that I outlined earlier are supported um, using visual analytics. So how is the comparison between two multiple time series conducted actually? This is a huge design space. And what we did in the paper is to carefully characterize how different solutions, visualization solutions can look like. You see at the left, a Yaxta imposed a variant, at the center, a superimposition um, approach. And at the right, you can, you can see that even dimensionality reduction can be used to project multivariate time series in 2D and analyze it. And if we analyze these three different types of approaches, at the left, you can see that it comes without a need for any colors. It's very easy to compare different dimensions. You can see three dimensions at the time uh, at the moment. But the uh, y dimension is the limiting factor because you cannot do hundreds of dimensions with it. 
You can see at the center the superimposed um, variant, which uses color to discriminate between different dimensions in the time series, which is also a limiting factor. And at the right, you can see how dimensionality reduction produces uh, an output using um, in that, uh, using a, a, a slope-like visualization of a time series in 2D. It's very abstract, to be honest, so you should be an expert to analyze it, but it's very scalable for many dimensions. And what we recommend is to use the Luxter post variant or dimensionality reduction, depending on the number of dimensions. And the good thing about this choice is that color is still preserved, and we can use it for parameter guidance, which will, I will show you in a second. And here it is. It's the idea to support the parameterization of some routine um, as a sort of guidance component, um, where alternative, uh, alternative results are visualized with different colors. You can see at the right that five different outlier treatment algorithms have uh, been used, and the results are uh, visualized with different colors. And you can see here in this particular usage scenario that is it possible to use the, yeah, it is. You can see here that, for example, this parameterization causes severe problems if you use this threshold, uh, because uh, a lot of information about this time series would simply be cut if you use the, the wrong parameter to do it. And this is why parameter comparison using uh, different colors is, is so useful. And what you can see here is that I left out uncertainty visualization, which I will unlock now. And you can now see our solution, how uh, uncertainty that is produced by a routine is combined in the visualization together with the original time series visualization. And in this case, the uncertainty visualization is realized by a symmetric area chart. So how is this going with the uncertainty aware analysis of multiple time series? The idea is to replay uncertainty that is produced by routines back into the analysis. And to do that, we need to quantify how uncertainty is produced by routines. And we came up with two different solutions. First of all, it can be the uncertainty of routines making their decisions in the process. But it can also be simply the change that is made to the time series in itself, which can be visualized. And if you are interested in that, you can read our UVA paper from last year. There's a typo in it, uh, which uh, Christian Bors uh, developed quite well. Um, if you want to go deeper into uncertainty-based visual uh, analysis. Regarding the visualization of uncertainty and multiple time series in combination, there is uh, another design challenge coming up because time series and uncertainty are sort of comp competing each other. And what we did is to analyze alternative visualizations based on a small multiples principle to visualize uncertainty in such an application as well. And what we came up with is that the heat map approach hardly has any problems with the characteristics that we deem important, but also symmetric area charts are quite appropriate to visualize uncertainty information. Um, and I think that the available amount of um, display space is something that may be, in the end, the decision criteria between these two different techniques. There's another example where parameter steering is explained once more uh, in a, use, a moving average routine, which uh, creates a smooth, a smooth version of a time series. Uh, depending on how the current value is defined, you can again see the different outputs using the, the color comparison. And in this case, we use the heat map approach to visualize the uncertainty that was introduced by a routine. And um, this is uh, another example showing the effects of alternative parameter, uh, parameter values if you use seven different dimensions. Uh, Looks the pose at the left, dimensionality reduction at the right. You can see that patterns are involved in this particular analysis. And at the bottom, there is a solution how the uncertainty of seven different dimensions of the time series can be condensed, in this case, using a box plot chart. For more information, I refer to the paper, just as well uh, as to the two different usage scenarios that we sh show there. And I would like to finish with a climate observation example, um, which you can see here, um, which again shows the parameter guidance uh, with the moving average curl and the heat map approach for showing the uncertainty visualization. Um, I would like to conclude the um, things that are going on. My light is going off, and never mind. Um, and to summarize, we are currently investigating the effects between uncertainty parameters and algorithms in the segmentation uh, workflow um, of the three different partners. And if you are interested, please have a look at the references which are provided here. 
Um, which brings me to the second part that I would like to share with you today, which is VR Visual Interactive Labeling. The idea of data labeling, which is motivated, strongly motivated by supervised machine learning, is the idea to attach labels Y to data objects X. And the principle is that humans provide this real-world information, and then we can use machine learning models to learn that information and to support humans in their tasks. The problem is that this labeling process is very expensive um, because it's a tedious process, boring, it's, it's roughly linear, it re may require expert knowledge, it may be subjective or context dependent. So there are many good reasons for incorporating visual analytics in this particular labeling process. And we did this in the past quite often. I would like to share some examples of applications with you. For example, our application in the music classification field. This is a work that a student has done. It's, um, in my opinion, quite nicely designed. It was presented at EuroVA last year, and it shows how users can label their song collections, can train and validate a personalized classifier with it. And in this usage scenario that is shown, um, uh, a classifier is trained with four different classes reflect by the four different colors that you can see. I cannot go into detail here. It's only a teaser for one labeling application. And here comes the next one. It's a labeling application that was designed as a design study together with medical experts in the cancer research domain. And our idea was to label the well-being state of cancer patients by the doctors themselves. We use the regression model to learn how this well-being can be um, yeah, reflected by a machine learning model and um, it conducted this in an interactive labeling approach. Um, uh, and it was quite successful. It was published uh, at the workshop for visual analytics and healthcare in 2015. A third example is about human motion capture data, where we labeled human poses in this example, kicking poses in a kicking and boxing database. And we used it to train and validate a classifier to detect human poses. Another example is interactive similarity search, in this case between soccer players. You see enlarged two soccer players at the upper left, and you can uh, and drag a slider to define a similarity between two, two, these two different guys, in this case, Mats Hummels and David Lewis, uh, which appear to be very similar regarding to the user. user and uh, we can use this tool for feature selection and similarity search. Uh, and the scenario that you can see is international superstars, as we call it. Uh, at the right, you see a retrieval interface that uses the similarity that we learned. And for Karim Benzema, uh, who is a very good uh, striker from France, uh, playing at Real Madrid, uh, six guys are coming up, which are Giovanni, Lewandowski, Kalu, Pizarro, Huntela, and Obameyang. These are the most similar soccer players according to the similarity notion that the user has defined. Another example, which was an early one, a proof of concept, was to define a similarity between countries. You can see at the left, an interface where you can drag and drop countries by a human perceived similarity. In this case, I tried to sort of define the um, define European countries in a geologically correct way. So this is defined by myself. And then we learned what similarity in model was uh, defined by the user, and then we can apply it, for example, for all countries in Africa, which you can see at the right. And you can see that African topology is quite well preserved, even if I labeled Europe and learned Africa with it. This was quite interesting that something like this works, and the result is shown with um, MDS. In this case, uh, it was a proof of concept that similarity can be learned. Um, the final uh, application is uh, by Mohamed Chigini et al. from uh, the Graz colleagues I'm working with. Uh, it's an approach that uses different views to uh, label multivariate data, again, to train and validate personalized classifiers. And in the usage scenario they took, in this case, it's uh, the classification of soccer players by personalized uh, classes. I would like to come to the problem statement regarding to data labeling. And in my opinion, there are two major challenges. First of it is, the so-called, I call it the so-called 
multiple labels problem, meaning there is an instance and the question is which label shall be assigned to this instance. In this particular example, we have three different labels and these could be assigned to an instance. And opposed to that is the question number two, is the multiple instance problem, which instance should be selected for the labeling process as a next step. I would like to go to the first problem at, at first. Um, um, which label shall be assigned to an instance? Um, I will only briefly give an overview of my thoughts in this regard today because I don't have the time, but still I would like to share four important things that I, I think are important. First of all, um, labeling is always um, a, a matter of the semantics of an application and what a human actually sees and what he deems to be the right label. And in many cases, it's difficult for algorithms to um, guess or predict the labels correctly. So I guess that in this case, it always takes a human to label correctly, create good ground truth, um, to do good quality labeling. A second regard is that labels should always reflect the user's information need. I use this binary classification task between relevant and irrelevant, which can only be decided by humans. Maybe it's even subjective, uh, so maybe it's even uh, possible to train uh, to label data sets according to the individual user needs. And this is also reflected by the personalization aspect. If you look at this guy, um, we always have two opinions about him. Either you like him or you hate him. So there are situations where there's no real ground truth and it seems to be dependent on the guy who is actually doing the labeling process and doing the interactive machinery. And fourth is to incorporate uh, expert knowledge if possible. I chose the medical domain as an example where you can see that a tumor was sketched at the very right um, and this can only be done by an expert and then we can try to segment it in machine learning algorithms which is done in computer vision so often. This brings me to the problem that I would like to emphasize today, which is the multiple instances problem, or as it is called, machine learning instance selection strategies. So which instance should be labeled next? And there is, um, this is my focus today, and I brought a uh, yeah, sort of thought with you. It's a saying from machine learning about instance selection strategies. The idea is to select few instances wisely and automate the rest to keep the effort that is needed for humans at a minimum. And I would like to share you uh, my insights that I gained in this process. From the machine learning perspective, there is an approach which is called active learning. It's very, very popular. It's very established. It's the idea that an algorithm, a model suggests candidates which would improve um, the quality of a, of a machine learner in the best way. And then users, which are also referred to as the oracles, label these individual objects, so focus on problem one. And this is, however, something that can be very boring or as emerging and all say, users are people, not only oracles. In fact, users label um, objects in this um, strategy, but users do not select the objects and they also have no idea about the model, its quality, and it's, and it's not transparent. In contrast to active learning, one can imagine visual interactive interfaces for uh, instance selection. For example, by using dimensionality reduction, you can see a T's knee projection at the, at the right. You can see all these different um, data that is uh, produced in 2D. And what users can do now is to select instance that they deem important because there are may maybe some interesting patterns that should be labeled or other sort of structure that should be labeled as well. And I would like to very briefly show you a video um, showing how this uh, labeling can be done in practice. In this case, a lasso interaction is involved, the video is repeating, and the human identified five different classes in the manifold and successively these five different classes will be labeled. And this is quite effective in practice. You can also use color, for example, to show what the classifier actually is training. And with this, users are not only able to label objects, but they're also able to select objects by criteria they define. And the model is also transparent because we can see the output of the model. Different visualizations can be used. For example, this convex hull metaphor, which shows the sort of the outbounds of the classifier predictions, also its outliers. 
or this butterfly metaphor, which was proposed by Tobias Schreck in 2008, uh, which I used for an experiment. Um, very briefly, um, the video um, now contains also this information. The classifier is interactively retrained. You can see that now a third class has been labeled, a fourth class has been labeled, and now a fifth class will be labeled. And you can see that with sort of five atomic interactions, this data set could already be characterized quite well simply by using visual interactive interfaces for labeling. So this is effective, yeah, an effective interactive process. Um, but there is a question coming up that I would also like to push about instant selection strategies. It's the question if model-based strategies and user-based strategies, what's the relation between them? What's the, uh, these two guys? What's the, what's the performance? Can they compete? And the research question that I um, brought up was if visualization involving users can compete active learning strategies and in instant selection. What we did was an experiment with the handwritten digits data set because it's so popular and frequently used. We, used, we implemented a series of active learning algorithms, uh, had four different visualizations um, and three different tasks, and uh, proposed our results at BAST in 2017. It was uh, published in TBCG 2018. Uh, it was the comparison between the, these different two worlds. And I would like to present the results. Answering the question if visualization is able to compete with active learning, and the question is, yes, it can. You can see at the performance charts at the right, uh, we're using color coding for human performance and active learning performance, that visualization can compete with active learning, particularly in the very first labeling iterations until um, active learning catches up and becomes better. And this is a success because now visual analytics is in the play and visual interactive interfaces can actually be used also in machine learning tasks. But um, I would like to come back to this slide, which emphasizes the idea to combine the strengths of machine learning and visualization. And this is why I would like to propose that active learning and visualization should not be referred to as a competition. Instead, it's the idea how to combine it. And this is something that we reflect in our, um, in our um, survey paper, which has the, uh, the title YAL, uh, a unified process for visual interactive labeling, which was presented in the TVCG, a TVCJ paper, a journal paper, a journal. Uh, and it's sort of our, our labeling mantra that we define for ourselves. Um, it's a survey of approaches in active learning and visualization. It combines the strength. It shows a process that you can see at the top of five different, uh, six different steps, uh, including all the challenges and all the existing solutions and their interplay. And it uh, was meant to ease the way for designers to create really interactive labeling interfaces. What I would like to show you in my last minutes is something that I did not explain so far. It is the question what this green performance line is about, which you have, you may have seen in the result slide two or three slides earlier. Now I would like to make, now I would like to make it explicit. What this is, is a strategy which is the quasi optimum that you can do if you know the ground truth information. This is also why we call this guy the so-called greedy strategy, because knowing the ground truth it's always possible in a greedy may, uh, manner to select the next instance in a way that the accuracy actually will increase most. And this is why we call this quasi-optimum strategy the greedy strategy. And you can see that there's a huge gap between every existing and tested active learning as well as visualization strategy and the goal that I'm now trying to follow is to reach that optimum uh, which has been defined by the greedy strategy. And coming to the research agenda that currently drives us in this particular project about instant selection, uh, just imagine that the performance is uh, now uh, visualized as a sort of vertical axis where the active learning strategies as well as the visualization strategies are sort of the bottom, um, sort of side by side. And the greedy strategy seems to define the optimum that is possible. And what we are currently doing is, for one, to combine the strengths of human-based and model-based strategies. 
And second, to understand what this quasi-optimal strategy makes so good and um, try to learn how to extract this information and use it for um, strategies that are not defined and published yet. The good thing is that virtually any active learning strategy can be formalized because the algorithms are described in the, in the publications in the machine learning world. So it's very easy to automate this process and to performance testing. However, visualization strategies defined by users, so observing users by they select instances is not formalized because it's something that uh, happens in the head of a human and um, this is something that is not, uh, has not been able to put into some algorithmic strategy. And of course, greedy is also not formalizable, but because if we would do it, and if you could it, the problem would simply be solved. So this is sort of the high level goal to formalize this greedy strategy. Let's start with the formalization of user strategies. Uh, this is what we thought about one and a half years ago. Uh, when we published the TVCG paper in 2018, we observed that users um, do not label arbitrarily, but they conduct a, a, about 10 different instance selection strategies. So there is one which we call centroids. First, it's the idea to always select the centroid of a pattern, but there is also a class outliers first strategy, which in this case would label the red one at the bottom to sort of we reduce the size of the red class because there's obviously an outlier uh, labeled, uh, falsely labeled. I would like to briefly show you a video showing first the centroids first strategy. It only takes five centroids to achieve quite a good accuracy about a unlabeled data set. The so-called class intersection strategy, which is the idea to select those instances which are intersected by um, many, many classes. So there is a sort of an overlay of many, many class layers. And also, again, the class outlier strategy, which I already have outlined earlier. It's the idea to get, select outlier patterns in classes uh, and with the idea to reduce the outbounds of classes. And these different strategies are as follows. I will not go into detail. You can look it up in the paper, but you can see that these 10 different strategies have been uh, actually used by users when selecting instances. And what we did is to implement these strategies and yeah, as a means to formalize it and use it for automatic performance analysis. And this is what we did in an experiment, a quantitative performance analysis experiment using these user strategies using the active learning strategies and also uh, upper and lower bound. And we published this at Eurovis last year uh, and the results look like follows. In white is um, a random strategy and our greedy at the top. In different colors are the 10 different user strategies and purple is always active learning. Uh, and what you can see, yeah, across 50 iterations in a labeling process, and what you can see is greedy is again the best. You can see that there are three very, very good user strategies, and it will be very interesting to use them in the future, but there are also weak user strategies. So what we achieved with this experiment is we found three user strategies, uh, which seem to be very, very good at start, which is the so-called equal spread strategy. I will use my pointer as well. It's the idea to um, address different areas of the data set very early to sort of get a coverage of all the data that's in, uh, involved. Dense areas first is the idea to focus on dense areas, but at different places in the data set. And centroids first is, yeah, naturally speaking, the idea to always select the centroid of a pattern. And opposed to that, and uh, yeah, interestingly, all these strategies are unsupervised machine learning based, as opposed to supervised machine learning, which is primarily used by active learning strategies. So we seem to see some pattern here between supervised and unsupervised, but also in the idea how to select vectors in general. And coming back to this slide, um, we are beginning to understand commonalities and differences between model and human-based strategies, and we can now um, propose that 
user strategies are sort of formalized for the first time and can now be used uh, to create new strategies. So what's the idea for future work? First of all, um, we would like to further formalize the greedy strategy. We already proposed in Europe a short paper, the, the first experiment about that. We are also about to present a taxonomy for building blocks for these strategies. Uh, um, we presented one um, approach at EuroVA this year. And there is this question if maybe instant selection can be fully automized, which is always a sort of high level goal in, all, in every machine learning task. And we are quite convinced that we may achieve this state with better instant selection strategies in future. I would like to summarize interactive data labeling, uh, which is model-centered in a way that increases the effectiveness and efficiency of, active, uh, of machine learning models, but it's also human-centered with the human in the loop, and it facilitates the data characteristics and semantics perspective, uh, incorporates uh, expert knowledge, human factors, it allows the personalization of machine learning processes as proposed, for example, with my problem one statement. And uh, this brings me to the references uh, of interactive labeling. This is an excerpt of the things that I was primarily uh, first author with. And this uh, brings me to the summary of interactive machine learning in general, which can be model-centered and human-centered, can be highly iterative and interactive. Um, it can help to make the process transparent, interpretable, and explainable. Uh, we have seen examples about personalized uh, machine learning. It can consider human factors, such as user strategies, and it can be open for experts and non-experts -expert as well. And this concludes my talk. I'm very happy that I did it 45 minutes. And once again, sorry for the delay that we had earlier this day. Thank you very much. OK, thanks for this super interesting talk, Jürgen. Uh, can you hear us now? I can hear you almost perfectly. Thanks for the question. OK. Are there any questions that came up during the talk? Let me start with one. Yep. So, um, you said, uh, in, the, in the end, I saw that unsupervised strategies were better than supervised strategies. Can you confirm that? Yeah, um, I will go back to the slide. Um, um, what I can tell from a series of experiments is that in the very first uh, labeling phase, so when the first, very first instances have to be selected, uh, unsupervised strategies seem to be better significantly. Um, and there is an obvious reason for it, because if you, if you use a, a supervised machine learning method, um, to select first instances, but the model that is used is actually untrained because there is no data yet. There is a classical cold start problem, a good start problem. And this is why um, many active learners and yeah, supervised machine learning techniques in general start to become better throughout the process when the first levels are set, but in fact, not at the very first. This is why my recommendation would be to start with an unsupervised process and then sort of switch to more supervised uh, techniques afterwards. Okay, that makes sense. Other questions? So the second question I had was about the data. So you had this, um, this, this idea of searching by example and searching by sketching. Yep. How do you deal with patterns at different scales? So you could, like the same pattern could be um, present in the data, right? So you could have a micro pattern that has the same shape than a macro pattern um, if you aggregate the data, for instance. Yep. Um, um, I like that question, and I know why you were asking it. Oh, um, damn it! That was my fault. Uh, can you still can you see the slides? Yeah. Good. Um, I will go to another slide, which I showed uh, in a similar context, which was about pre-processing of multivariate time series. Uh, this one. Uh, the question somewhat refers to the examples that you can see at the right, which I, by the way, st stole by a wonderful talk that Eamon Keel gave about 15 years ago about time series. Um, 
And it's the question how to normalize um, time series patterns, how to treat the value domain in general. Um, and what I can tell from my research in that regard is that it has such significant impact on what a retrieval algorithm will find in the end that it's very, very important to either characterize these characteristics, such as, as you, you named in your example, either characterize it very, very clearly in advance, and if not possible, to unlock these parameters and enable users to define their similarity notion uh, on the fly. For example, you as an expert user could say um, which type of normalization you need to find the patterns you want. OK. And so third question. Uh, if not, so I have multiple ones, but I could ask them next time we meet. Um, in the interest of time, we'll close the talk for today. We're quite late already. Um, the next monthly lab talk will be in January, given by Dennis Falco from Geograts, uh, Institute of Graphics um, and Vision. And he's going to talk about his research in the context of virtual reality. Um, the date is not yet final, but we will send out an email as soon as we have the date. Should be out in the next couple of days. Okay, Jürgen, thank you again. Have a nice start in the day. I think that was a pretty nice start in the day to give a talk. Um, but thank you again. Thank you for listening.